Today's speaker is Michael Heimbinder, the founder and executive director of Habitat Map, a nonprofit community organization dedicated to raising awareness of the impact of environment on human health and the differential impact of exposure on low-income communities. Today, he will be speaking on their efforts to improve personal exposure assessment and sharing that information on the geospatial burden of exposures and its impact on communities. With a final, remi final reminder to submit your questions via the Q&A pod in WebEx, I will hand the virtual podium over to Mr. Heimbinder. Michael? Uh, so thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, just again, for those folks who might be joining just now, my name is Michael Heimbinder, and I'm the founder and executive, executive director of Habitat Map. Habitat Map is a Brooklyn-based environmental health justice organization, and the primary thing we do is we work with schools and community-based organizations to create planning and advocacy maps. And we do that with our two community mapping platforms. One is habitatmap.org, which is focused on qualitative information, so it's text photos and videos inserted into map markers, and then map markers are aggregated into thematic maps focused on health and quality of life issues. Uh, this is a poster we put together a few years ago that shows kind of the range of different topics that have been mapped on Habitat Map, everything from combined sewer overflows to contaminated properties to so rooftop solar panels, uh, lots of things, uh, some good, some bad. Uh, but all an effort on the part of communities to communicate what's happening in their neighborhood, in their community, uh, to the rest of the world. About, uh, let's see, six years ago now, we launched Aircasting in 2011. Aircasting is another community mapping platform, but it's focused on quantitative data rather than qualitative data. So it's uh, physiological measurements and environmental measurements that are recorded by sensors that are then communicated to a smartphone app called Aircasting. Uh, and then from there, they're mapped and graphed in real time and then sent to a server, aircasting.org. Uh, this is a platform diagram kind of showing you how the platform works. Uh, so at the top, you've got your air quality sensor, which is the AirBeam. Uh, the platform is actually device agnostic, meaning you can connect the AirBeam to the platform, you could create your own instrument and connect it into the platform, you could take an existing instrument and plug, in, plug it into the platform. Uh, so anything that senses environment or physiology uh, can then be fed into the platform. Uh, from there, it goes to the Aircasting mobile app, which basically maps and graphs into real time on your phone. Uh, and then from there, your measurements are sent to our server. Uh, you can also actually set, set up your own air casting server and send the measurements to your own server rather than ours. Uh, it should be mentioned that this is an entirely open source project. So all the code for the, for the app and the website is open source and available through GitHub, and all the schematics and designs for the AirBeam are also available through GitHub. At the bottom, you'll see LED wearables, so your optional public air quality indicator. Uh, so we've developed some LED wearables as have other people, and what that means is that these lights light up in correspondence to the measurements. Uh, so it's a way of, one, it's a fun uh, uh, kind of electronics project that ties in with the platform, but it's also a way of uh, kind of communicating the measurements that are coming into your, from your sense device to people in your immediate vicinity. And then at the bottom of the platform diagram, you'll see it's all focused on individual community and government change. This is some screenshots uh, from the app. On the far left, you'll see this is the sensor's dashboard. And so each of these tiles represents a stream coming in from the sensors into the phone. Uh, and so in this case, we're measuring carbon dioxide, particulate matter, breathing rate, heart rate, humidity, and activity level. Uh, and so, you know, you can see it could be any number of different variables that you're monitoring. Uh, the next screenshot is just simply a graph. This is showing heart rate over time. Uh, and you can see, again, the colors. So, uh, you know, 40 to 85 beats per minute would be green, 86 to 130 would be yellow, uh, and so it's color-coded, and you can change the relationship between the colors and the numbers so that it's suited to whatever you're trying to display. Uh, the next is going to be uh, the, the sessions map, and what you see on the sessions map is a bunch of colored dots. They're laid down so close together that they look like a line. But essentially what's happening is every second, the sensor is making a measurement, and then it's laid down the map as a color-coded dot, and the color of that dot corresponds to the intensity of the measurement. 
And at the top, the heat legend unit, which is green, yellow, orange, red, shows you the relationship between the colors and the measurements. Uh, in this example, on the sessions map, we're looking at decibel levels. Uh, so you can download the aircasting app. It's free if you've got an Android phone. Uh, and you can start using it right away because you don't have to have an Airbnb. You can actually use the onboard uh, phone microphone to take sound level measurements. And that's actually how we launched the aircasting app uh, was just recording sound levels because we were iterating and it was the easiest thing to do, but also because it's the number one complaint to New York City's 311 hotline. Uh, and so we knew it would be relevant to New Yorkers. Uh, in a city like New York where there's noisy neighbors, noisy airplanes, noisy restaurants, it's definitely something of concern. Uh, and then the last screenshot over there on the far right is the crowd map. And on the crowd map, you'll see there's actually the sessions map underlined. So on the, on the right-hand uh, side, you'll see kind of a trail of colored dots. And then you'll also see these colored squares. And those colored squares correspond to the average measurement in that location over all time. And when you get to the website, you can actually filter it so it's different times or different carriers. But in this instance, it's just showing you what the average measurement in that area is based on the readings from all air casters. And so you can see on the right-hand side, I, my, my session trail of dots is primarily yellow and green. And then you can see the squares are also primarily yellow and green. So you can compare my measurements kind of look like the measurements that have been taken previously, the averages. Uh, the, next, the next slide is uh, what it looks like when you get online and you look at aircasting.org. And so you can see it's expanded. You get, it's, it's kind of a richer interface because you've got a bigger screen. Uh, you can display more information. So what this is displaying is I'm cycling uh, from Brooklyn to Manhattan, to lower Manhattan. And in the process, I encounter two kind of peaks in concentration. The AirBeam actually measures in micrograms per cubic meter, but this is an example showing it outputting as hundreds of particles per cubic foot, so a particle count rather than a mass-based measurement unit. <clears throat> and what it's showing is that primarily I'm in the green, uh, which is below uh, 1.25 thousand hundreds of particles per cubic foot. But at any rate, it's showing you kind of the relative levels here. Uh, and you can see there's two spikes. One, when I'm crossing over Myrtle Avenue, I, I get up into the orange. And that was me behind a kind of diesel van that was going over a roadway that had recently been scraped down so they could re-asphalt it. So there's a lot of particles in the air from the truck and the roadway itself. And then the, the bigger spike that's longer and enduring uh, is the one that is happening as I pass over the Manhattan Bridge and, and I go over the FDR Drive. And so that's the confluence of the FDR Drive, which sees, you know, thousands of vehicles every day, all the traffic backing up on either side of the Manhattan Bridge trying to get on and off, uh, and then also the subway. The subway rides over Manhattan Bridge, and every time it goes into the tunnel or out of the tunnel, uh, it ejects particles. And so that's what you get, why you get that spike. It's pretty consistent, actually, when you're cycling or walking over the bridges, uh, particularly the Manhattan Bridge. You'll see this again and again, day after day. Uh, this is, again, the crowd map. But, again, like I was saying, you can measure lots of different things. This is a crowd map of sound levels. So it's showing you Prospect Park on the lower right, uh, and then it's kind of grading into the neighborhood called Park Slope, and then down there's a thin body of water in the northeastern corner, and that's the Gowanus Canal, which is a federal Superfund site and also has a, a mix of residences and industry. And so you can see in this example I provided it because it's very clean, the park is relatively quiet, it's green, the Park Slope neighborhood is primarily yellow with some green, and then when you get down to the Gowanus, which is mixed residential and industry, industrial rather, versus the Park Slope neighborhood, which is primarily residential, you start to see these kind of blocks of orange come in. Uh, this is the air casting family. So this is not all the devices that connect into the air casting platform, it's just a few. Uh, I guess we've got 12 here. Uh, there's probably over two dozen different types of instruments that have, uh, to date, been connected into the platform. I wanted to highlight a couple to talk about uh, the different types of instruments that are plugged in. So this is an instrument that measures carbon monoxide, uh, nitrogen dioxide, and carbon dioxide. And it was made <clears throat> by a company uh, called QSense. And, uh, and so they decided that rather than developing their own platform, they would develop their own instrument 
use the aircasting app to collect the data and then send that data into our back end, our aircasting.org, our server, and then pull it out using our API, our application programming interface. So the aircasting platform is modular. So you can kind of pick and choose which ones you want to use. So in this instance, they use their own instrument. They use the aircasting app and the aircasting website, but then they pull the data from our website and put it into their own server to do their own analytics. Um, and so this is a device we'll talk about more because there's a, several community groups that are using it in Chicago. Uh, this is an instrument that is a commercially available instrument. It's called the Zephyr BioHarness, and it measures a number of different parameters, including core temperature, heart rate, heart rate variability, uh, breathing rate, and activity level, uh, and maybe something else. It's a, it's a large number of parameters it can, it can measure. Uh, and so this is an example of people doing physiological measurements at the same time that they're sometime, sometimes doing environmental measurements to see if there's a correspondence between the two. Uh, but the Zephyr has a software development kit that comes with it, so it was easy for us to take this, uh, this instrument and basically patch the measurements into our platform. So people make their own instruments. In this in instance, we take an existing piece of hardware and connect it in, uh, and then, of course, uh, we mentioned earlier the air beam. So the air beam is an instrument that, uh, that we developed uh, for measuring PM2.5 or fine particulate matter. Uh, we ran a Kickstarter campaign and raised uh, just over $50,000 in order to produce the first batch of units. Uh, so that was 500 units we made, and to date we've sold just over 1,500. Um, the air beams have been sold all over the world, and the reason we developed the instrument, we were looking for an instrument so we didn't have to develop our own. But there wasn't something at the time that was low cost, open source, and relatively accurate. And so we endeavored to build our own. It was about a three year process of research and development to finally come up with the Airbeam uh, manufacturer to make it available for sale. The Airbeam is approximately $249, and, or it is $249. Um, and I wanted to compare it to another instrument that some of you may have heard of, which is a Thermo Scientific PDR 1500. So this is an instrument that weighs about two and a half pounds. Uh, that's five times as heavy as the air beam, which weighs about a half pound. Uh, and it costs uh, $5,000. So it costs 20 times more and weighs five times as much. The, air, the Thermo Scientific has a bigger range and it's more accurate, but it's not that much better than the air beam. Uh, and so you can see that the air beam is really a, a much cheaper, uh, much uh, lighter uh, piece of equipment to use, and it comes with an entire platform that it connects into, which is oftentimes people struggle with that. Groups will reach out and say, you know, we've got these instruments, but we don't know how to log the data from them. Once we log them, we don't know how to visualize it. Uh, and so that was one of the big impetuses for us developing the aircasting platform, as we saw again and again uh, groups were innovating, but they were working on one piece of the puzzle, and we wanted them to be able to work on the piece of puzzle they were most interested in, and then take the rest from us and use it however they like. Uh, this is one of our Luminous accessories. So we've made vests that light up. Uh, we ran a, a workshop at New York Hall of Science where students made all sorts of different things, tiaras and sores and purses and clutches uh, that light up in response to the sensor measurements. Uh, and so this is one we developed. You can get the designs for this. It's a kind of DIY, do-it-yourself one. Uh, but you can see it fits in the palm of your hand. Uh, you can wear it around your neck, hold it in your hand. Uh, let people know what the measurements that are coming from your device are. Uh, and then I wanted to go through some examples. So uh, like I said, there's over 1,500 air beams out in the world to date, about half in the U.S. and half outside the U.S. Uh, and it's been really fascinating to see the types of projects that have uh, ad adopted the aircasting platform and used different pieces in how they're using it. Uh, so this is uh, a group at Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health, and they're partnered with WNYC, which is the local NPR affiliate for New York City, and it's a project called Biking and Breathing. So if you type in WNYC Biking and Breathing, you'll see there's a whole series of stories over the last few years that have documented the work that this group at Columbia University is doing. And their thesis is that, uh, as you might expect, uh, you know, air pollution is more toxic depending on the dose, and the dose is bigger when you're, when you're active. Uh, so you're breathing in a lot more dirty air when you're cycling than you are if you're walking or riding in your car. And so they wanted to see what the impact of this is. And so the woman in the picture is, is wearing a, a vest, 
And on that vest is tens of thousands of dollars of equipment. Uh, they're using the air beam. They were using the carrier, which was the instrument I showed you earlier that measured uh, CO2, NO2, and uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, and they're also using more expensive equipment, like the microwave, which measures black carbon, which costs $5,000. Uh, they've got a very expensive monitor for doing the physiological measurements, like breathing rate. Uh, and so they have a, they had a, a group of volunteers who were wearing these vests and going around the city, and they recruited them through WNYC. But when the WNYC stories ran and they recruited volunteers, they were getting hundreds, I believe even, in fact, thousands of people who wanted to volunteer. You know, their budget was necessarily limited. They could only afford so many of these very expensive vests that had all of the equipment. And so using the air beam and the carrier allowed them to involve more participants because they didn't have uh, all of these multi-thousand dollar setups, but they could hand out more air beams and carriers and therefore involve more people. Uh, and so this is an ongoing project. It's still going on. In fact, I think they were trying to recruit another cohort this summer. And WNYC continues to publish stories on it. So it would be interesting to see their results. Uh, this is a group, the Global Climate and Health Alliance, which is actually a group of uh, organizations focused on climate change and air pollution, addressing climate change and air pollution in cities all around the world. Uh, and so what they did is they ran a campaign called Unmask My City. And in this, uh, this example, they're in India, and he's saying, you know, India has the second deadliest air, pollutions in South, air pollution levels in Southeast Asia. And they took our luminescent accessory design, and they modified it, and they put it inside masks. And they had people in all of these cities all around the world uh, posing, you know, in their neighborhoods with their uh, luminescent accessories, their luminescent masks, talking about the issues that are pertinent to them. Uh, and so this is a great example to see. Uh, and what you see is when you go to the website on Mask My City, you can go to the different cities. <clears throat> and each city, what they've done is that, like I said earlier, you could set up your own air casting server. So they've segregated their data. So instead of pushing their data into aircasting.org, they've sent the data into their own server. And then when you go to their website, you can see the aircasting maps with the pollution measurements on their, on, their plat on their website. And then below that, you see the measurements coming in. And below that, there's a call to action. And so each of these cities is kind of asking for something different. Uh, and like I said, this is an alliance of multiple different organizations. So for instance, if you go to the Salt Lake City page, you'll see they're asking for a stronger state implementation plan. Uh, in Turkey, they're asking for better particulate matter monitoring. They only measure PM10. Uh, they don't measure PM2.5. So when you go to the website, you'll see they're asking people to write to their government and say, do more extensive monitoring, include PM2.5. And if you go to Brazil, they're asking people to fill out a survey regarding what measures people favor for curbing air pollution and cleaning up the air. Uh, so this is a great example of a group that kind of uh, took the platform, used the parts that they needed, and tied it, in with an, tied it into an advocacy campaign that's specific to each of the different regions that they're dealing with and ties in with their local partner. Uh, this is another example. These are two uh, regulatory agencies. So one is the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, uh, and the other is Air Rhone Alps. Uh, which is in uh, Grenoble in France, or they monitor the air quality or regulate the air quality around Grenoble, France. And what they've done is they have mandates to communicate to the public about air quality and, and uh, public health. And so what they've done is they saw the AirBeam and the AirCasting app as a great tool to do that. And so they basically run programs where they'll check out AirBeams and they'll check out Android phones and they'll have participants go out and take measurements. Sometimes they'll do it thematically. They'll say, you know, you ride a bus, you walk, or they'll see, you know, different modes of transportation. Uh, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency did it at a county fair, and they kind of looked at the emissions coming from some of the, uh, you know, charbroiling uh, setups that they had there. Uh, and so it's been a great tool for them to communicate to the public. And I know there's a lot of concern among uh, some sections of the regulatory community about uh, individuals using low-cost instruments and how do they interpret the, the, the measurements and how do they compare to, uh, you know, the uh, HUI. Uh, and those are all legitimate concerns, uh, but, it, it, but I wanted to highlight these two examples because it's an example of regulatory agencies embracing the technology and then knowing that they need to also accompany it with the appropriate messaging so that people don't miss uh, interpret the measurements that they're getting uh, and understand its impact on public health, the measurement, the relationship between the measurements and the public health impact or the impact for that individual. 
Uh, again, both of these organizations set up their own air casting server. Uh, so they fed the data into their own websites. Uh, this is an example of a private company. So I wanted to provide examples of lots of different types of organizations using the air casting platform. And so this is an example of a private company called Sonoma Technology. <clears throat> and what they did is they created an entire curriculum called Kids Making Sense, empowering youth and communities to clear the air and improve public health. Uh, and what they're doing is they're working with different air quality districts in California and school districts to basically teach young people about all the most important things about particle pollution. So you can see out uh, of the table of contents, you know, you've got our air, uh, our air and pollution, particle pollution, particle sources, health effects, measure, how do you measure it, uh, field measurements, interpreting your data. Uh, and so this started out actually as a much smaller kind of pilot curriculum that we did with them and that was funded by the Knight Foundation. And then they kind of took the ball and ran with it. And they said, you know, this could be an important part of the work that we do, an important new business opportunity for us. Uh, if you're not familiar with Sonoma Technology, they're the company that runs EPA's airnail.gov platform. And so they provide near real time uh, uh, information about air quality and forecasting about air quality at airnail.gov. Uh, this is a group, uh, this is called Shared Air, Share, Shared Action, Community Empowerment Through Low-Cost Air Pollution Monitoring. It's a, it's a, it's a STAR grant, so uh, the EPA gives out STAR grants. I believe this one was uh, on the order of magnitude of around $750,000. Uh, the lead uh, on it is Kansas State University, but there are several other universities that are Chicago-based, and then a handful of different community-based organizations all in Chicago. And so what they're doing, in this example I just pulled, they were looking for volunteers. Uh, they were doing some monitoring. So each of the different organizations that uh, Kansas State and their partners are working with have basically uh, worked together to develop a plan for monitoring in their neighborhood. And it's been very extensive. They, they surveyed individuals or the, the community members from these organizations about what their concerns were, where they think it would be most pertinent to monitor, where it would be safest to monitor. Uh, and then they went out and they developed monitoring plans. And they've taken some measurements and they're just starting to get back data and interpret it. Um, and they're not really sure, I believe, uh, what they're going to be directing their efforts at. It's definitely about understanding air quality, but it's also about connecting the dots between air quality, public health, particularly the health in these communities that are mostly environmental, I think all environmental justice communities, uh, and then how do you connect to the policy and actually make change? Do we, do we regulate the pet coke files differently? Uh, and they've had some successes already in terms of their monitoring. Uh, this is a project that we did in partnership with several different organizations. It was led by uh, a coalition called Transform Don't Trash. And this is a report that we put out together. So it was Transform Don't Trash is the umbrella organization. And then we partnered with New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. Uh, New York City Environmental Justice Alliance and Align. Uh, and what we're looking, what we're looking to do here is that <clears throat> New York City handles, uh, waste, uh, in a way that's not environmentally friendly. And so there are several initiatives to try to clean up the solid waste system, uh, in New York City. <clears throat> and this was a report we put out called Clearing the Air, How Reforming the Commercial Waste Sector Can Address Air Quality Issues in Environmental Justice Communities. And so what we did is we partnered with several different community-based organizations here in New York City, uh, in Brooklyn, and in South Bronx. And what we did is we trained young people to measure air pollution at trucking-intensive intersections in environmental justice communities, and then count trucks at the same time. And then we saw, is there a relationship between the number of trucks coming through these intersections and the air quality? And then we comp compared our air quality measurements using the air beam to the closest reference monitor run by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. And we also looked at what kind of trucks were coming through the neighborhood because we were specifically targeting uh, waste haulers. Uh, so you could see in the South Bronx, almost half the trucks were private waste trucks. And we measured only during uh, the morning rush and the evening rush. And so that's pretty astounding to find that half the trucks coming through some of these intersections were garbage trucks. Up to seven times higher uh, PM 2.5 concentrations <clears throat> were measured as a half hour average when compared to the closest DEC monitoring station. <clears throat> there was one commercial waste truck every 24 seconds. In North Brooklyn, a third of them were private waste trucks. 
The highest measurements over half hour average were five times higher than the closest DEC monitoring station, and it was one commercial truck every 60 seconds. Uh, we also monitored inside the cabs, uh, the truck cabs of the commercial weights carters. Uh, and so it was really high there. I'm going to show you some slides later uh, that are interesting, kind of reveal what's going on there. Uh, this was a map we put together showing the South Bronx. So the, the maroon colored flags are the waste transfer stations. So the South Bronx and North Brooklyn have the densest concentrations of waste transfer stations and collectively uh, handle about 80% of all the waste moving through waste transfer stations in New York City. Uh, obviously very inequitable. Uh, the brown lines are the truck routes, so a very dense network of truck routes in the South Bronx. And you can see the, the big colored circles represent the two intersections we measured at and the maximum half hour PM 2.5 concentration uh, during the time that we monitored. So at one, it was between six and eight. I think, believe it was actually seven. Uh, and the other one, it was between four and six times higher than the closest DEC monitoring site station was registering. Uh, why, why were we doing this? So we were trying to clean up New York City's waste system, but in a very specific way. So uh, certain cities in the United States have implemented something called garbage zoning. Seattle's done this, Los Angeles has done this, or they're in the process of doing it. Uh, and what it means is that instead of it being a free-for-all where every private carter can pick up waste from any business, what they've done is they said, we're going to carve up the city into zones. And then carters are going to bid to service that zone, and they're going to win it based on not just costs, but also what's their environmental record, how do they treat their workers. Uh, and what this is going to do is it's going to kind of raise the bar. We're going to end up getting better service. We're going to have a lot fewer trucks on the road, which means less air pollution, less greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and we're also going to have less noisy trucks rumbling down the roads, tearing up the roadways, because we know it's these heavy trucks that do the most damage to our roads and bridges. And so this is just an example of this actually from uh, Don't Waste LA. It was a graph created for them. Uh, and so it's just showing you that, you know, a single truck can do all the same pickups that these, these seven trucks are doing in the, in the top one. Uh, and so that's what garbage zoning is all about. Uh, now, I mentioned earlier that we also monitored uh, the inside the commercial waste vehicle truck cabs. And we were able to do that because one of our partners on the project was a, a union. So unions are also interested in seeing this pass because it means that they would, they would be able to uh, perhaps uh, the, the shops, the carters that are unionized might have a, a leg up on their competition because they're treating their workers right. Their workers aren't getting injured at the same rate. They're not uh, dying or losing limbs. It's a serious problem in New York City, uh, abuse of, uh, of the workers who work for private carters. Uh, and so what you see here is on the left, you want, first, the thing you see that jumps out at you first is these guys are driving all over the city. If you had a zone system, they wouldn't be driving all of this. They'd drive to a single neighborhood, do a bunch of back and forth, and then drive back to the waste transfer station. And so they're, they're crossing, in, in this case, you know, they're going across two boroughs, the entire length of Manhattan. And what you're seeing is that the, uh, the, the, most of the time on the left, when, this guy, when these guys are in their truck, they're at six to 25 times the ambient concentration inside their truck cab. And on the right-hand side, they're at mostly two to four times the ambient concentration. Now, what accounts for the big difference? Well, one truck is post-2007 when the EPA implemented uh, pollution controls on diesel trucks. Uh, and so they have things like diesel particulate filters, and they're running UL ultra-low sulfur diesel. Whereas the truck on the left is, I think, was running for, I think it's like a late 90s vehicle. Uh, and so you can see a huge difference in the exposure of the workers based on what type of vehicle they're, they're riding in. And you can also just see the extremely circuitous routes that they drive to pick up the garbage and fill up their hoppers. I'm going to leave it there. Uh, thanks so much for listening. And let me know if you have any questions. Uh, this is my contact information. You can email me at info at habitatmap.org. Uh, habitatmap.org is uh, our, one of our community mapping platforms. The other is aircasting.org. Takingspace.org is our blog. And we're on Twitter at twitter.com slash habitatmap. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. That was a fascinating presentation.